so they're afraid. I'm recording and we're good. Hey guys, um, why don't we get some info from who's here? Is that, where are you guys all from? Go ahead and drop that in, in chat. Uh, I am happy to be back and doing another webinar for you guys. I feel a little less uh, out of my element with the webinar this time because I uh, uh, know how it works this time. Uh, Zoom is a little different than webinar. So, uh, we're talking about retention in this one, and we're going to be talking about retention as to how it affects preschool and school age kiddos. Um, I see we have somebody from Indiana and someone from Oregon. That's awesome. I'm in Colorado where it's actually cloudy, which has never happened. So let's go ahead and roll with retention. And once I get to the end of this, you guys can ask any questions you would like. Um, so preschool retention and, hey Janice again, <laughs> preschool retention and school age retention are two different things for me because the conversations that you're having with preschool parents and the conversations that you're having with school age parents should be very different. So I think if you're, um, well, I know, when you're trying to create retention in your preschool programs, the conversation needs to be around how this isn't just an activity, because when parents view this just as an activity, they're more likely to do it for like a short space of time than to stay continuously enrolled with you. So you want to be able to present your preschool program as an educational program for them, where they're gaining skills that have some sort of transference in real life for them. So, um, that is why when I, a while ago, I developed a preschool program where we talked a lot about uh, how preschool, what, it was preschool gymnastics, I'm sorry, preschool concepts through gymnastics. So that was like our little tagline. So when people would ask us like what our preschool program was about, we would tell them how they're getting an, all this educational experience out of it. And they're gonna be learning, uh, you know, they're gonna be learning things like patterns and they're gonna be learning things like, um, colors and rule following and so social emotional things and all of those things are super important um, and for those of you who don't know like pattern patterns particularly have a lot to do with reading and math so the earlier kids learn how to like use patterns and decipher patterns the better they are going to be at math long run um, so I recommend everybody get their preschool kiddos I mean, I'm sorry, their preschool coaches, uh, some good background in like early childhood education. Uh, there's some great courses you can take online for that. There's like Happy Gymnastics has a course, USA Gymnastics has some courses um, so that you can talk stocks, bleh, sorry guys, talk specifically to those kiddos. You wanna talk specifically about um, how education and what you're doing in gymnastics go hand in hand. Uh, not to mention also talking about with retention, re referring to retention, like this is a continuous process. So, you know, when they're three and four, your programs are socially, emotionally aiming at these goals. And when they're uh, two and three, you're aiming at these goals. So you're working on all those social, emotional, and those fine and gross motor skills. You wanna be able to pinpoint that for the parents and say, this is why they need it, and this is what it's teaching them. And you need to tie it back to why it's good for their kid and their brain and their development. Um, if you're just telling them they're coming into your gym to learn skills at those ages, the parents are gonna definitely view this more as like, this is just this little piece right here. Um, okay, so that is, what, how I built, build retention with preschool uh, and communication is always going to be key throughout this whole thing. Uh, so you want to talk a lot about with the parents, you want to create a lot of communication processes so they know what their kids are learning. You know, if that's a newsletter that goes out weekly or monthly that says in this month we're learning this in preschool or if that's a bulletin board in your gym or if it's a handout that goes out, whatever it is, you want to be communicating. And then you also want to really encourage your uh, coaches to communicate with the parents and give parents feedback and tell them like how well of a job their kid's doing or how well of a job their kid isn't doing or what they need to work on or what they need to improve on. And in preschool, these really shouldn't be skill-based conversations. These should be conversations that are based on 
where their child is in development compared to where they should be in their development. And we need to also remember that, that we don't want to like over normalize either. We don't want to say, well, this is where, you know, between 18 months to 24 months, your kid should have this. And if they don't, they're behind. Like, we don't want to say some stuff like that, especially if you're not a professional in that sense. But, you know, helping parents feel comfortable with where their kid is at is really the goal. Um, a lot of parents don't really know where their kid should be when it comes to like gross motor development, fine motor skills, when it comes to the social emotional part of it. I mean, if you teach preschool classes, you hear that all the time where parents are like, oh, I don't know, should they be speaking better or should they be doing, they don't really know. And a lot of times they don't even know to like ask doctors or ask around. Uh, and it's not intentional. I think sometimes it comes from a place of fear and they're concerned um, that if they don't say something, I mean, if they do say something that they're gonna maybe hold their child back. So, you know, if we can give them like this guidance too of like, if we have like the knowledge for them and you can say to them, this is where your child is and you can have those communications with them and this is where most kids are this age this is normal, you're gonna become an important piece of their child's um, growth and development. And once you have become an important piece of growth and development for these kiddos, you will see a huge change in how parents perceive your program. You don't become an activity, you can't become like a part of the community and the family and it becomes important to attend there. So uh, that's my like bit on preschool. It's really all about child development. Um, my new preschool program, we're also working on doing uh, some, a lot of baby gymnastics where we're gonna, where we're specifically coining the term proactive play, where we kind of show the parents like ways that they can play with their child that encourages that growth and that development they're looking for. Um, okay, so retention for, and pop up any questions you guys have at any time in that chat, and we'll also ask questions at the end. Um, but retention with uh, school age is a little bit different. So uh, right now, in my opinion, retention has always been important. But right now, retention is more important than ever because with COVID, we don't know what's going to happen next. We don't know if doors and all of our kids are going to return. We don't know if they're all going to wait to return. We don't know any of that. Any kid who does come in our door after this, it's got to be our goal to retain them for as long as possible. Um, and we talked about this a little bit the other day uh, in my other conversation where we're talking about marketing. I mentioned to you that the average to retention rate seems to be about six months for school age kiddos. And that's not really great. I mean, we should really have the goal of keeping them for longer. And I think there are like two different types of students we have to consider in this retention rate too. Um, you're going to have the students who do nine months at a time and then they take every summer off. And then you're also going to have the students who do that one little six month stint and then maybe never come back. Um, and I think what we would like to see is two things. We would like to see the six month thing become nine months for everybody. And you would also like to see, you'd like to build in your program a way to discourage that break in the summer. Uh, we're gonna talk about how to do that, but if you can have like, re increase the retention rate of your seasonal athletes, and then also increase, increase the retention rate of athletes who have potential to become more than seasonal, your program is gonna do better overall. And it's really not until you address these types of retention that you can start to address growth. Because if your retention is constantly recycling and you're constantly gaining new students every six months or nine months, or like you're constantly having a lot of replacing to do, um, you know, those six months isn't uh, everybody leaves at the end of six months and then a whole new pack comes in. But if you're constantly doing that throughout the year, you know, every month, you're losing that large sum of kids, you're never going to be able to achieve growth. And after COVID, a lot of us are going to be in a place where we need to first figure out how to reti re um, achieve retention because it's gonna be hard maybe to grow. We don't know, we hope not, but it might be harder to grow. And if it is harder to grow, then we need to focus on retention. And if we can really nail down retention, moving forward after COVID is over, once you know we're all feeling better and we're back to hopefully normal one day, growth will become much easier because you'll have 
a base of students who always maintain or remain with you and you're not trying to replace 20 kids every month you're trying to replace 10 or you're not trying to replace um 40 kids every you know year or however many you lose on an average per year you're trying to just replace like 10 and then trying to grow it another 15 20 kids that's easy to do so let's talk about how to do it so in your school age kids um i would say the number one key is effective effective communication parent communication so when we uh started talking about this earlier um and i am gonna screen share um, so when I, uh, when we first started talking about this, the first preschool, as I said, you want to make sure you're communicating to your parents. And I said that how you communicate to your preschool parents and how you communicate to your school age parents is different. So with your school age parents, there should still be some communication around like how the sport is benefiting their child, but now they're going to also really want to know how their child is progressing on a skill level base, typically. So if that's really what they want to um you have to design a system that tells them that so i am going to share my screen and this uh this flyer i'm about to show you is incredibly old so let me share it for you but um one of the first things i did is and i like to tell everybody i like to build like a very clear concise path for the parents so my path is usually very clear online and then on top of that, I like to do little handouts uh, when they first start the class. So I have two different types of programs. Um, in the beginning when we were talking about, I mentioned there are two different types of retention. There's like, like seasonal retention athlete and then there's the yearly retention athlete. So this is for my yearly retentional athletes. My seasonal retention athletes tend to be in a different program, what I call basic gymnastics. And it's really not about like skill progression so much as it's about fitness and fun. Um, and the, my gym stars, which I'm renaming for my new gym, it's gonna be called Wonder Girls, is a completely different animal. And it has a very clear path. And all of my, in the US, we have something called uh, Excel now. And I consider Excel a really great feeder program for my rec program. And that like, my goal is to get every kid who goes into Wonder Girls into Excel, into a lower level competitive team, bronze or silver at some point. So my, Gym Stars slash Wonder Girls program, my Gym Stars program had a 60% retention rate um, for four years. Meaning most of those kids started out in Gym Stars, did a couple years of Gym Stars, and then did a couple years of lower level Excel before they moved on. And that was gold, because that's where we made a lot of money. Um, plus it's fun. I mean, I'm, I love getting to know the kids too. It's not all about the dollar here, but it, this, it, you know, this is what helps our businesses um, survive is having large amounts of kids who pay more than the average team kid. Uh, and you know, my Excel kids, um, especially for my lower level bronze and stuff, they're paying, I want to say about $17 an hour, whereas your, your upper level JO kids are probably paying like six. So profit. Um, so the, the handout that I would hand out to all of my parents right here that you guys can see, um, this was our girls level one class. And it gave them a brief, it didn't give them each and every skill they were gonna learn, but it talked about some of the skills they were gonna learn on each event. And these are the skills that we were expecting them to master in this class. And then on the back of it, there were some little FYIs. Um, and one of our big things was our Gym Star Show, which I will talk about how that really helped our retention. Um, we did it twice a year and we told parents about it like upfront. So it wasn't like, oh, date to be determined. No, we picked out a date like, six months out we put it on the calendar both both dates because now the kids have something to like look forward to and work towards okay and if they have something to look forward toward look forward to and work towards they're going to stay enrolled in your program um i mean i've had and i we very strategically placed these uh we had one that was like mid-summer i believe and then we had this one in october and the purpose of that was it was very intentional if I have a gym star show in the middle of July or like beginning, I think it was beginning of August. If I had a gym star show in the summer months, you were probably more likely to stay through the summer to participate in the show. Um, and there was other things in here, like feel free to check in. We, we have one here, feel free to check in on your child's progress at any time. So uh, part of one of my keys to communication with my parents 
uh, and there's lots of them, but one of them was my parents knew that they could ask at any time if their child was ready to move up. All they had to do was go up to the front desk and say, can I put in an evaluation request? And they would put an evaluation request in, and then that, uh, the front desk would pass that off to my person who did the evalu evaluations, and then they would evaluate the child, and they would meet with that parent like personally at a different time. And typically that person did it during their class. If they couldn't do it during their class, uh, we would schedule them for a separate like 15 minute slot, like come in before or after class. We'd find a way to make it work for everybody. But the parents having that, oh, that ability and ease of getting their kid tested and never like having to wonder really worked. Um, and my coaches all actually were mentored in the same way that if they ever had a child in one of their gym stars classes that they felt was ready to be tested and moved up, they, same thing, they went up to the front desk, they said, I think this kid is ready to move up. They put in an evaluation request and then my testing person would pull that kid and test them. So uh, that was really positive for the parents. They really enjoyed having a process where easy to figure out when and if their kid could move up. We also did have like a two, like a testing week that we did before the gym star show because we would do like a special like little ceremony at the gym star show about who did get to move up. Um, it, it wasn't like we didn't have planned testing. It's just that you didn't have to wait for planned testing. I, I have told this story before, but when I was in um, school in my second grade year, our teacher had this system with folders where they were colored and they were like red, yellow, and green. And when you finished one folder, you got to just move on to the next at your own rate. And that for me was like life-changing when I went into that class because I was always ahead of everybody. I get bored easily and I got in trouble for that a lot. And so she actually, it got to the point where she developed like a blue folder for me per level because I would work through all the folders just to get to that blue folder. Um, this is the same concept. Like if kids know they can move up when they're actually ready, they're going to work harder. Um, and that was really awesome and motivational for the coaches, the kids, everybody. Um, another communication piece that I always did that really increased my retention is I encouraged all of my staff to chat with the parents on a regular basis. So everybody asked me, how did you do this? A couple different ways. Um, one, we did group warmups and I know some people like shudder at that idea, but if we had three or four classes all starting at four o'clock or four 30 or, you know, however many classes started together, they all warmed up together. They all did some sort of game stretch fun thing together. Um, this gave some of the coaches the opportunity then to walk out into the lobby and chat with parents. And we didn't find that to be a problem. Like people are like, how did you keep them from sitting? Well, it just wasn't acceptable. Like if you weren't helping with warm, warm up or group stretch, you were talking to a parent. And we also made sure it stayed pretty equitable because we would do like a team check-in at the beginning of every day. And in those team teams, uh, we would have the uh, team check, uh, sorry, staff check-in. I don't want to use words that might confuse you guys. We would do a staff check-in. And in those staff check-ins, one of the things we would all talk about was like, who needs to speak with a parent that day? And, you know, typically I have or some, some other lead instructor in charge. And if they notice that like Brian for the last three weeks hasn't done any warm-ups because he only talks to parents, they would kind of call him out. They'd be like, hey, listen, Brian, you've talked to a lot of parents recently. Kelsey needs to talk to parents this week. Can you please let Kelsey do it? So that was really, and then also why those group check-ins, those staff check-ins would help is at the beginning of every, had the opportunity or the beginning of every day, I should say, not class, but every day, um, that was an opportunity or my lead staff to encourage, uh, good question, Megan. Um, that was a really good way for me, my staff to encourage the uh, um, staff to go talk to parents. So uh, I would um, encourage the parents. I mean, I would, I would say who needs to talk to somebody. And that right there would kind of make everybody start thinking like, oh, I should probably be talking to somebody. And if I haven't done it in a while, I need to do it. 
uh, that was how I kind of made that happen. And I would always kind of ask them too. I would help. I, what's, what do you need to talk about? What do you need my help talking about? And occasionally you might get a coach who would be like, I'm having a child who's like being really difficult and I really need to talk to mom about it and I don't know how to do it. And so she, that coach and I would talk about what the concerns and issues were and then be like, we'll do it together. And so by me going with them and I showing them and modeling for them, they became more empowered over time to do it themselves. Uh, my younger coaches would sometimes struggle with that longer, but like overall, that usually really worked out. For me. Um, most of my staff, I mean, that used to be our number one compliment that we got was we can't believe how much your staff talks to the parents. We've been to so many different gymnastics gyms and no one even ever talked to us. And you guys talk to us all the time. And part of that is, is because if you build this sense of community and a place where they feel like they belong, they're going to want to return or they're going to want to stay. That's how you build retention. You make them feel like it's someplace they belong. Um, I am going to answer Megan's question. She asked, how do you suggest we have conversation with parents post COVID? Most parent areas and lobbies will be closed. So, you know, I think we're going to have to get creative on that one. Um, this may be encouraging our coaches to text be encouraging our coaches to email more and this may be scheduling separate time with the parents so that's a that's a good thought but communication will be key to this to your uh being able to retain your students okay so and as long as you always set clear expectations they're not going to disappoint you and if they do you should join my hiring and firing one because we can talk about how you get rid of them. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see, what is the next point? So another key element then is we talked, we brushed on this. I started talking about like the clear path and I showed you that handout I did. So I, um, on my website, it said like very clearly stated, like, like in gym, like if your child does gym stars, the um, direction this program is going in is to get your kid in Excel, lower level Excel. This is how you get to competitive team. If you want to be a competitive gymnast, this is where you go. It's, uh, and we kind of explain the Excel program and how it's fun. Um, I really sell it as like the soccer of gymnastics, like, like the, the rec gymnastics that anybody can join. Um, you know, anybody who was in gym stars one, Everybody knew they probably had to be in gym stars for about two years to get there. We would talk about, you know, year one is when you're learning a lot of the basics and picking up a lot of skills. Um, and then year two was going to be uh, the year potential to move into Excel. So everyone kind of knew this is what the path looks like. And so once you get to gym stars too, so once you get to, it might be year three if it takes you longer, but once you get to gym stars two, we'll start considering you to go to bronze Excel. And then once you're in gym stars three, we'll start going, considering you to go to silver Excel. We have an upper level gym stars level four for some kids who were not ready. And when I'm talking about that or why I'm bringing that up is because the upper level kids uh, or sometimes you get parents who are like hesitant to put their kids on team, even though they like know where that's where the path is at, they still wanna kind of wait a year. And I see a lot of programs mess this up a little bit because they no longer have a place for that kid to go once they've invited them to team. They're like, well, that's the last place we had. So, so by me having like those extra two levels after like the first available level to go to Excel, if a parent came back and said, you know, I don't think my kid's ready yet, um, it wasn't a big deal. I could be like, no big deal, you can just go you can just go into the next level of Excel, or I'm sorry, of star, gym stars and hang out there for another year. Your kid's still gonna progress. And when we're, we talk next year, they might be ready for silver or they could still be ready for bronze. Um, guys, I kept my silver and bronze super simple. Like my silvers did not have round up back handsprings. Um, my goal was to have the simplest, easiest, cleanest routines I could put out there to A, score well so the kids had great experiences there, and then B, make it easy for them to get to those levels. I didn't want it to be hard for them to get there. So, and then we really painted like a really positive picture. We talked about like it having, of Excel, like it has a really low com commitment level. The competitions are not very strict. Um, it's a great way for your child to participate in uh, organized sports and it doesn't cost as much. So we would paint this really good picture on how they got there. We would talk about the testing. We would talk about the skills they needed. Um, and we would uh, talk about, um, oh gosh, talk about testing. We talk 
talk about the skills they needed. Oh, and then we would talk about like, you know, pro projected time. And then we made it very clear that every kid is different and we can do what is ever needed for every kid. You know, some kids spend two years in Gym Stars 1, some kids spend a year in Gym Stars 1 and spend six, mo uh, six months in Gym Stars 2 and they're ready for Excel or some are not. So we just made sure the path was clear, but also not like, I don't want to say, like it wasn't restrictive. It wasn't like this is the only way this works, which I do see that a lot. Um, <laughs> so I ha there's some really good questions in there too about JO and stuff and I will explain that for sure. So we made uh, move ups really easy, easy and accessible. Like I said, we had like concessions. And let me tell you guys, one of the best things I did with my testing was I had only one person who was allowed to test for everything. So that person, I would make them available during our testing weeks and they would spend the entire time over by the rec classes, but uh, with our gym stores classes testing them. And then that was the only person who got the testing move up forms. They were the only person who were allowed to move anybody up levels. And what that did was just created amazing consistency in my program and my coach is really new like you never can sell the parent that they're allowed to move up until that coach has said that person the testing person has said so if they haven't said so you can't say it they were allowed to tell the parent i'm recommending your child be tested to be moved to the next level and i wanted to make you aware of that but they cannot tell they could never tell them they could move up so that is a really i think important piece of creating consistency in your program and it removes some of that ambiguity of like, well, Coach Amber says that this is a good handstand, but Coach Josh thinks it's a terrible handstand because it doesn't matter what Coach Amber or Coach Josh think because all that matters is what my top move up person, Matt, said. And that's the person who got to do it. Um, so then the other part that we did with this that really creates retention is you need to have some sort of like reward system um, it needs to be, you know, I don't, anything you want to use, it could be a poster, it could be, um, it could be just the online tracking. You want to make it easy for the parents to look at, you want to make it easy for the parents to see. Uh, and I have to tell you, and I'm sure some of you listened to Tony, um, the online, or he talks about his, and it's so funny because we kind of like had this idea and like I didn't eat and He's been implementing this for a while, but I'm about to implement mine at my gym. But now I'm making my tracking, like we're gonna have little pins and they're gonna get a special backpack and they're gonna get, um, we're gonna not just be tracking skills that way, but they're gonna get like rewards for, uh, they're gonna be getting rewards for their, to, to track their, um, like things like kindness and bravery and resilience and, you know, confidence you know you're very confident today so you get a pin for that and you want to give the parents like this is something that helps them like buy into like my kid is getting something more out of this other than just gymnastics like this you yeah it's great if they're learning gymnastics we all know that that's great but parents don't really just want that anymore they want to they want it to be like a whole picture and so if they're getting like good quality instruction plus they're getting all these other life skills with it that is going to be feel really valuable to them and it's going to make it so that your parents are more likely to stay invested in your programs. So we also did a leotard. Um, so each level had a special leotard that went with it and that was really cool and the kids, you know, oh, I'm going to gym stars too, I get that leotard. And then they wore that leotard at the show. Um, at the show, like we made the show a huge big deal. Everybody knew it was happening. It kind of functioned a little bit like a gymnastics meet. Uh, they went to each event, they showed their skills off. We didn't do scores or anything like that, but at the end, everybody gets a trophy. That's another thing that the kids love. They all love getting trophies, which you know to me seems so silly, but because we get them everywhere you go, but they don't get them ever in their life. So if they get like they have this opportunity to get a trophy and you know basically what they've achieved is that they've worked hard to get there. Um, and then we also uh, it was a, an event where they get to show everybody um, they invite all their families. So they get to show it to everybody. So we made sure we made those events really big as well. Um, so if you kind of take all of these elements and you make a really well thought out plan for the parents, and you have a really good uh, 
program, like a detailed program in place for them, and you're communicating with them, and you're showing them what the gymnastics means to them beyond, like just learning skills. Like you know, there's community to this, and there's uh, confidence to this, and there's all these other amazing things. They're going to learn to be brave. They're going to be learn to be responsible. They're gonna, all those things, and their kids are actually going somewhere and able to achieve something. People are going to be more invested in your program and want to stay involved. So retention is like a really important, it's a really important business idea that we have, but a lot of us don't know how to create it. And with these types of things, can create better retention. So with that being said, one of the questions that was over here did ask, like they stated, like, what are we going to do once safe sport happens? And I said, it might be texting and email. I'm also considering, and I have not done this in the past, but I want to do it in the future. Um, I want to offer parent-teacher conferences, um, you know, at once at least twice a year, the parents get to come in and talk to their coach and you know, for even if it's just for 10 or 15 minutes and see where their, their kids at and how they're progressing. I think that is going to solve some of this issue with how, uh, how are we going to talk to parents during COVID? Um, because if you can do it like more in a private setting, you're not going to have to worry about it as much. Um, you know, in the immediate future, I think we're all going to have to tackle the like, how do we communicate with parents that we're not really inviting into our lobby? And someone mentioned safe sport. Um, I don't even know. I mean, I think if you're offering like, viewing on your video cameras. I don't know what, you know, and if, if it's accessible to parents, I don't know what Safe Sport's gonna be able to say to that. Pardon me, guys. I think this is a really interesting role that they're all gonna have to figure out, um, parents being able to come in and view, because if we're not really allowed to let them come in, are they gonna, is Safe Sport just gonna expect us to like completely shut down our businesses? I think that would be, you know, really sad and really disappointing. Um, if that's what they're expecting of us. So I think that will be interesting. Um, so definitely drop me some questions in Q&A. I was a little bit faster today than I was last time. Um, I have someone ask me, how do you encourage your kids to do Excel in such a fun, relatable way when other gyms you compete against are using it to train JO kids and keep them back in Excel levels? So, Deanna, the answer to that question is, um, I don't care what other gyms are doing. And this, and I don't know about other states because this could be false, but my bronze kids competed a hand, a forward roll to cartwheel, a half turn, a leap and a tuck jump. And almost all of them were scoring nine sixes or higher on floor and our beam and our bar routines were just as simple and the idea that someone else could have a bronze kid doing a better like a routine with like higher skills in it outscores you doesn't make sense to me because it doesn't matter like this isn't this isn't elite gymnastics so those scores i mean those skills don't outweigh my kids skills what matters is technique and cleanliness. So I actually never had my parents really worry about this or upset, be upset about this. And I will tell you, I actually do use my Excel to move kids into JO. I don't compete levels uh, two or three in JO. Um, I go right to four. And most of my kids do Excel uh, for the first year, maybe two years. And then we take them into JO from there. Um, but we always have like a B group that does that. Like, you know, they're the kids that we think will have not only like the physical ability, but meant like the mental fortitude because JO takes a little more, um, you know, snuff. And I just, I just, I can't to be honest. I didn't have that problem because I focused on making my routines really good and clean and knowing that they would score. Like the first year that Excel really became available and that we adapted it here in Colorado, um, everybody kind of adapted the old JO like level two routine for bronze or something like that, or maybe, yeah, level two. And it had a round off in it and um, none of my kids were scoring well. They were, well, I shouldn't say that. They were scoring nine fours. <laughs> it really bothered me. So I asked the judges uh, at state, I said, what can I do to get that score up next year? I don't want nine fours. I want nine fives. I want nine sixes. I want nine sevens. And they said, well, we're killing you on that round off. So I was like, cool, take out the round off. It's not required. Why, why put it in? 
and that's when next year after that my kids always were scoring at nine six or higher i mean i very rarely had a kid score low on the floor um because we did that and the parents didn't care in my teams anyway the parents didn't care what the other kids were competing they cared what their kids were scoring that their kids were happy and that they were doing well so i've never i encountered that question like that problem my parents were never frustrated because you know, if a kid in another team was doing a round off back handspring as a bronze, I mean, I'm sorry, as a silver, and my kids weren't, I mean, those kids usually didn't beat my kids anyway, because their round off back handspring probably wasn't that clean. Um, so that's like the best way I can answer that. Uh, and then TJ is asking, what program do you use for testing skills or do you make your own? So I, I usually just make my own. Um, I make some sort of like skill sheets that we get like posters or something that we hand out. Um, you know, moving forwards, I might track it also on iClass Pro so the parents can see it as well. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know that I'll change that. I think it's really fun for the kids to have like some sort of poster or some sort of keepsake to take home. Um, okay, so Kristen is asking, what is a good retention rate considered to you percentage wise? So, in my, uh, I would like to see my retention rate of my more developmental program be at least 24 months, if not 48, which is what I had before. And again, I considered my bronze and my silver part of that. Uh, so I would like them to be in there for at least two years, if not four. Percentage wise, I mean, I considered 60%, which is what I was getting. 60% of my kids stayed for that long. I thought that was pretty good. Um, I don't think, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a gym that has a 60% percentage, percentage, I'm sorry, a 60% retention rate of four years. Um, you know, I think in my, so that's what I want to see in my developmental, somewhere around 60%, but in my like less developmental program, where it's more basic, I'm probably looking where I'm talking, I have like more of a fun gymnastics class, that I'm probably looking for the retention rate to be somewhere around 40% because it's not really intended to keep them there. It's intended for them to have fun. Um, if they're enjoying that program, and I recommend them moving to the other program. So uh, what was the leotard required? We did not require the leotard for our showcase and that worked well for us. I would, we saw, we um, had about 75% of our kids purchase the leotard. Uh, and we did try to make sure it was like a cheaper leotard. We didn't do a really expensive one. And we weren't trying to make a ton of profit off of it. I mean, it was nice to make some profit off of it, but the goal was more um, to help them feel special. So that was Kristen's question. Can you elaborate more on having one tester? Does that employee work full time, like at the gym every day, or do you have the coach that identify an athlete who might need to move up, and then that employee comes into that specific daytime class? Anything you can expand on, explain on that? Okay, so I did. It wasn't a full time employee; it was part time employee. They probably were about a twenty hour a week employee. Um, they were always someone who was also usually what I consider like my rec lead. So that person also had some management positions and they would probably be a floater for part of the day meaning they coached they usually coached excel for me for part of the day and then they also would float on the rec side for part of the day to help coaches out i always have a floater floaters are awesome um how do you look up your retention every um so if you can get a floater to be with your classes for like doing the first two hours when we were busiest, it was pretty easier for that person to go over and test. Occasionally, because they didn't do that every day, they did that like two days a week or whatever. So occasionally that person's job, so, so they sometimes like if that happened on like Tuesday, look at a kid on a Tuesday and on Tuesdays they're coaching the whole time, then that's when we would bring someone in at a different time. You know, they would schedule them in a, like a 15 minute block before class or after. We always, we always managed to work it out. Um, it never really seemed to ever be a problem where we got kid tested within the first week. And if it really got, I would just do it. Um, which, you know, I, anything I said kind of, I don't want to say trumped them because that's not how I work, but like it, if, I, if I trusted them, I would expect they're going to have the same standards as me. So if we really got desperate, I would just do it. But we just made sure that person had floating time and that usually worked for us. Um, okay. How many hours do your gym stars practice? What about your Excel? Okay, so my gym stars 
So Melissa's asking how many hours my gym stars practice and how many my Excel bronze practice. So I like the two day a week program for gym stars. And this is like gonna blow all your minds, but like for some reason in our industry we have this weird idea that kiddos cannot um, come to, to the gym two, to, two times a week when they're recreational. Like we think parents aren't gonna like that. Um, karate does this, swimming does this. There's like a lot of programs out there where they're like, if you really wanna gain something, you have to be here more than one day a week. It just doesn't work in an hour. And they just have that conversation up front, which is kind of the conversation I have with my like gym, like. When I'm actually like the master of like, my kid's not learning a cartwheel. We need like one of those uh, videos on like, when's Katie gonna learn her kip? We need like, when's Kelsey gonna learn a cartwheel? Any one of those videos. Um, I'm really good at like explaining to kids like in a lower level basics class when a parent comes to me and they're like, I wanna pull my kid because they haven't learned their cartwheel yet. And then I break it all down. I'm like, okay, well, your kids travel, your kid comes to class one hour a week. They rotate to three events. I'll explain three events in a minute. And when they get to floor, they're there for 15 minutes with about three minutes of instructional time and then about two and a half to three minutes per station. So each week, if we work cartwheels every week, your kid has spent two and a half to three minutes on a cartwheel. You're not gonna learn anything in that space of time. So usually when I have a parent come and ask, that's how I get them like into like, I'm like, oh, you wanna use, you want gym stars instead. You wanted to learn like some skill skills. Like this is not meant for like, complete retention of skill or I'm sorry um gaining of skill I want there but that's not what this is meant for this program is meant for fun you want to learn skills you want to progress you want to program it's twice a week and uh you'd be surprised how well that sells that then my bronze and silver excels do four hours a week um again I keep my routines really really simple so when I take them from gym stars they've already been coming two days a week for one one hour so adding an extra hour on them is really easy to digest, to digest and easy to move them up. So keep that in mind. Like, like that's a big thing I hear a lot too, is like I can't get kids to move into my team program. Um, and I think it's because they don't think about, well, you're asking them to go for one hour a week to suddenly like six hours or whatever you're doing your preteen at. And two hours to four hours is not a big jump. And we maintain that for two years. And again, my bronze and silvers were nine sixes on floors, nine eights on parts. Uh, you know, nine sixes and sevens on vault. Uh, beam, nine four, nine five. Beam's a little harder to learn in those hours, but um, let me follow that with three events too. So I have surveyed parents over and over again over the year, and I asked them over and over again, what are the skills you are expecting your child to learn in gymnastics? And the two answers are always a pullover on bars and a cartwheel on floor. So I refuse to do four rotations in a rec class. We always do three. Oop, I can't make a three apparently. We always do three. And the reason we always do three is because all parents really care about are floor and bars. Beam and vault do not exist in their headspace. They don't have enough understanding of gymnastics to understand what it is or why their kids would go there. So did three, three events. Every, no matter if it's the basics or the gym stars, they do three events a week and we just trade off the vault and the beam with each other. And for me, vault is also tumble track. So um, something to think about when you're putting together your schedule. Why oh, I can't make these say done. There we go. All right, then Kristen asked, more often the parents asking about their kids moving up or the kids that are not close. How do you suggest speaking to those parents? Okay, so. When I talk to those parents, um, I'm not gonna lie to you guys, I'm really like pretty blunt and I'm realistic. And I, I tell them like, your kid just isn't there yet. And here are my suggestions for how you can get them there. And this is a good way for me to sell private lessons to my lower level coaches. So uh, I'll say extra time in the gym is gonna help. And I really encourage some private lessons. Um, and that, you know, that should, that should help them. They should come in and do some privates and they should gain some skills. And we'll talk specifically about what they're missing. Um, I haven't had too many parents leave upset about that. Um, you know, I, I just haven't. And I think it's because I'm blunt and because that's who parents know me as that person, uh, know me as that, that, that person. So because I come out like I, they know that's what they're going to get from me, they kind of respect it more. Um, really appreciate the beating around the bush personality um and then do you think monthly versus sex retention 100 percent yes 
I actually offer monthly auto pay with sessions, which is a whole other conversation. But I, the reason I offer sessions, I offer people the option to pay monthly within the session because it's easier to swallow. You know, nobody wants to pay $300 upfront. But I, my, and it's all in my new program, and it says very specifically the reason we do sessions is because no child can gain any skills in a four week period. And your child is not really going to be anything in that time because they're still just adjusting. So um, I do rec I do really like sessions for that reason. Plus, there's a lot little there's less work for my office staff. But it does have to be what works well for every program. So you have to kind of figure that out for yourself. Um, thank you. I really like this as I went into a program. I'm okay. That's not a question, but a statement, but thank you. <laughs> How long are your classes with three rotations? Uh, they are an hour and we do seven minutes of warm up, And then we do five, three 15 minute rotations. And then there's like five minutes at the end, I think, or like eight minutes at the end. And we let the kids, um, you know, we, we always like a little like group huddle at the end where we talked about what we learned in class because then they'll leave and tell their parents what they learned in class because if you don't talk about it, like little kids forget what they learned. So we like to do that. And I asked them what they had fun out and stuff like that. So uh, usually it's about like a 10 to seven minute warm up time, three 15 minute rotations, and then like, you know, seven to eight minutes at the end to huddle. Uh, um, oh, I keep forgetting to hit the answer, guys. Um, do you use trampoline as an event? No. <laughs> Very, uh, I'm not like a tramp person. So my husband is also a coach and he is the tramp guy but he really doesn't even teach start teaching tramp until they're in team anyway um and he teaches them like all kinds of things like cody's and kabooms but i i'm not really the tramp person i use just rec i'm, I'm pretty much done tumble tracks good enough um how do you talk to parents about bringing in into rec kids twice a week most of my rec kids just do once a week and it seems like every time i try to explain to parents that they don't want to learn a ton i mean once a week just keep them. yeah so like I said, I'm really good at spinning that conversation. Um, a, it's built into my website already. Like, if you really want to have skill gains, you're going to have to come twice a week. Uh, and I think a lot of sports do this better than us. They have that comfort. Like, think about it. Even soccer practices twice a week, guys. <laughs> like, even the, like, rec soccer leagues practice twice a week. So it's really important to, like, make that a part of your, your like, signing up. Like, my and that's why I intentionally have two programs. I have basic gymnastics over here, where the conversation is: this is a fun fitness class where we're going to work on some gymnastic skills, and we're going to um, work on balance and coordination and strength and core strength and all those things. And then this is where we're really focused on gaining skills and learning how skills progress and learning how to progress through gymnastics. Um, both of these are community-based for me. Like I want them to feel like they have a community and it's a lot of fun and they like being there. This one is the one that if you want to be if you want to be a gymnast and you want to learn more about gymnastics, you want to be here. And that seems to work for me. Plus the whole breakdown thing always works. Um, as soon as I'm like, well, they spend three minutes on a car wheel per week and we might even only work car wheels every other week. Then suddenly they're like, oh, I didn't even think about the fact. So you've worked six minutes of cartwheels this month. And of course your child is not going to learn a cartwheel in six minutes. Uh, that one seems to really work. And then I think this is a repeat question. What does a typical class rotation timeline look for three rotations? Did I answer that question good enough for you guys? Someone asked how to find your retention rate in Jackrabbit. I actually don't know that answer um, because I don't use Jackrabbit. I'm not familiar with Jackrabbit, but I know it's in there. I do know how to find retention rate in iClass Pro, and you can do it for 12 months at a time. There is a report for that. Um, I answer that question. Uh, there is a report for that, and I found it. You can do it by year, so like like a whole report where I pulled two years in a row, and then we matched the kids' names, and then we looked at how many months they were enrolled between those two years, and that got us our retention rate. Um, and you can ask iClass. You can call iClass up and ask them how to do that, and I'm sure Jack Rapp had his, uh, has something similar, and I know that studio director has that. Uh, in Gym Stars, do you have the same coach both days? Yes, I do. It's actually a requirement. Um, my coaches want to work my Gym Stars program. They're excited to do it. They love the shows. So 
it's pretty easy for me to convince them to work two days um, or to work the two days they need to. And typically what I have for my schedules is I have a Monday, Wednesday grouping and then a Tuesday, Thursday grouping and then a Thursday. Um, what about the di difficult parents who try to bully their way, their kid into the next level and don't won't accept their kid isn't ready to move up? You can't be afraid to say we aren't the right fit for you then. Do it all the time. Um, I shouldn't say all the time because people know what to expect from me, so I don't get that too much. But when I do, I'm not afraid to say that. I just had this happen, no, no like eight months ago. I had a parent who she was convinced she needed her daughter to be in the same class as friend who was in preteen at the gym I'm at now. And um, I was like, that's not how this works. She doesn't, your kid doesn't just get to go to preteen just because your kid's friend is there. And she was being very nasty to me and really bullying. And about 10 minutes into the phone conversation, I said, I, you know what? I don't think we're the right fit for each other. I really think you should consider another program. And of course that really upset the mom. And then she told me how she was gonna tell everybody all over town that we were the worst program ever. And guess what she didn't do? Any of that. Um, and people respect you more if they know you're willing to do that. Um, they know that you're not going to be pushed around. It doesn't mean I don't care about my customers and it doesn't mean I don't care about the parents and their opinions. It doesn't mean any of that, but they know that I'm not pushed around. It really matters because uh, they won't try to do it as much. Um, I'll give you guys like one, one other little fun story. Uh, dealing with teen parents, uh, lower level Excel kid, and we had some coaching issues and I ended up firing a coach mid season. Wasn't great, everybody hates doing that. And I had a parent who was loudly like complaining about our program up in the in our loft area and I could hear her. And I was listening to everything she said. And then I walked upstairs and said, I think you and I have a problem and we need to go talk about this in private because this isn't where you should do this. And from that moment on, I didn't really have any parent talk about us behind our backs again. They they all knew like. Cassie will call you out on it, so you might as well come talk to Cassie about it if you have an issue. And yes, that parent was asked to leave at the end of the season. Um, if you guys have any other questions, throw them out. I think we got a couple more minutes, but I, I wanna thank you all so much for coming. I really have enjoyed doing this. Uh, I love sharing knowledge with people. Uh, last time I didn't mention, I do consulting and stuff, so if anybody's interested, you can just Cassie, K-A-S-S-I-E, Oh, wait, that's not my email. Sorry, guys. You can email me at Cass, K A S, love, L U V, Hague, H A A G, at gmail.com. And that's just my name, Cassie Haig. And my middle name is Love. <laughs> so, Cass, Love Haig. Thank you all so much for joining. And I hope to uh, see you guys all on Facebook again. Thank you, Cassie. Yeah, thank you. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks. <laughs>